Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's edition of the Washington County Public Affairs Forum. We have a wonderful guest, an interesting, if not frustrating or depressing topic, but I'll let other people speak about that. I would want to make the point that we'll have a special presentation about a program that's going on in Beaverton uh, the last five minutes of our, of our program today. So don't forget to stay for that. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll talk a little bit more about the forum. I'll just remind you that when it comes to questions, you need to be a paid-up member of the forum. Our executive director is elsewhere today. But don't worry about it. If you really want to buy a forum membership, they let the president take money, too. Oh. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, from Washington County, dealing with homelessness issues in our county, we have Annette Evans. Thank you very much for being here, Annette. opportunity to speak this afternoon about an issue that many of us uh, deeply are concerned about, and that's homelessness and, the, and our housing crisis. Um, I want to thank Eric and Spencer and Rob and all who've made this opportunity today possible. Uh, today I'm going to provide an overview of our homeless trends and demographics, our system capacity and our ability to respond to this crisis. Uh, poverty and the socioeconomic uh, barriers that affect many that end up homeless in our community, and some of the priorities that our community partners are taking forward, both public and nonprofit and private, in the year 2016, so that we can make a profound difference in what's happening in people's lives. This is also my opportunity to share with you, but to hear from you. So I look forward to your questions following my. A brief presentation and after today I've given you my business cards I would entertain call me email me this is a community-wide issue it's not just a county issue a city issue or a community issue it's a county-wide all of us together working collectively to address this issue homelessness is a complex issue but we cannot allow the complexity to overwhelm our work in making progress to address the emergent basic needs of people who find themselves unstably housed or homeless. And we need to look at what are the root causes of this issue, and I will touch on some of that today. Before I get into the data, I think it's helpful to understand what is the definition of homelessness. We have multiple definitions, as you can probably imagine, within the public sector. Um, and I want to talk mostly about the literally homeless definition because that's the population and the data that I'm going to be reflecting on today for the most part. Uh, homelessness was defined uh, under the McKinney-Vento Act by President Reagan when he signed it into law in 1987, which was the first significant federal legislative response to the issues of homelessness in our nation. In 2009, President Obama reauthorized the McKinney-Vento Act under the Homeless Emergency Assistance and Rapid Transition to Housing Act, or as we call it, the HEARTH Act. The HEARTH Act addresses the definitions of homelessness to make it more clear and focused, and also addresses the funding needs to address this social issue under the umbrella of the federal strategic plan called Opening Doors. In Washington County, we have a tenure plan called A Road Home, that plan was adopted by the Board of County Commissioners in June 2008. And in the Federal Strategic Plan, uh, they adopted their plan in 2010, following the Heart Act approval, and it will end in 2020. So the first definition that you see is literally homeless, unsheltered. Unsheltered, literally homeless people are those people who are living in places not meant for human habitation, primarily living on the streets, in vehicles, camping out at our airports, max uh, tra uh, transit centers, um, camping in our parks or in uh, rural areas. They're the individuals that are frequently um, in need of uh, our institutional care through uh, the hospitals, through the emergency rooms, um, our criminal justice system sometimes, uh, unfortunately. And so they, they tend to have a lot more needs and barriers. Uh, the second literally homeless population is our sheltered population. Our sheltered population includes those individuals who are staying in emergency shelter 
uh, transitional housing designed for homeless persons, which can be a short stay of one to 24 months, and our safe haven programs. When we talk about literally homeless, these are the two situations that primary funding from the federal government under the HEART Act comes to support. And so in Washington County, we spend nearly $6 million annually addressing the social issue. One million comes from Washington County government funds through a recently passed public safety levy uh, that was on the ballot, which funds the emergency shelters or portion of the emergency shelters. It, only, it does not pay for all of the costs. And then it also pays uh, through county general funds for some very key programs that provide transitional housing, such as our Homeless to Work program, and I'll, I'll reference that again later. Three million of the funding comes from a competitive grant application that uh, I write in partnership with many wonderful uh, provider agencies out there, and I'm gonna call out a couple of them, Renee Bruce with Community Action, and Annie Hart with Family Promise, uh, the Department of Housing, Val Balfrey, uh, and also in partnership with Housing Authority, and if I've missed, I'm looking to see real quick. And, but it's a very competitive application. The government says based on your homeless needs, they'll, they'll allow us up to a capped amount, and you have to write to that, and you have to demonstrate the outcomes uh, in reducing and ending homelessness within your community using the funds that you had received the previous year. Washington County has been very fortunate that we have scored three years in a row as being the highest uh, continuum of care award application uh, in the state of Oregon. And one year we missed the highest in the nation by half a point, according to our HUD official. So uh, we know what we're doing, um, and a lot of that comes from the fact that we have a very strategic and very detailed 10-year plan, and we have the fidelity of that plan and the collaborative partnerships to make it happen. We also have $2 million in support services funded by various other public and private funds through philanthropic um, uh, uh, or uh, federal, state, local government funds and faith organizations that provide funding. And so that provides a lot of the match or leverage that's required by the public funds, the federal funds, because there is a 25% match for the funds that um, come through the McKinney-Bento Act. So as compared to the literally homeless, which I just previously talked about, there is also uh, three other definitions under the Hearth Act, and that's at imminent risk. So those are homeless individuals who are going to be homeless within 14 days, and they lack the subsequent resources to be able to prevent their homeless situation. In many cases, uh, we are seeing an imminent risk rising with the number of people, and it's due to evictions that have been placed upon them to leave their apartment or the rental unit. Um, many of these evictions are no-cause evictions. A no-cause eviction says uh, that is uh, provides the landlord the ability to terminate your lease um, within 60 days uh, notice, um, even though you may have not done anything wrong. Okay? And a four-cause eviction is when you've done something against your lease. We have worked really hard in Washington County to reduce the number of eviction court cases going through our um, through our court system and prior to the 10-year plan in 2007 there were 4,222 eviction court cases filed and we really focused a lot of work on uh, education with, uh, with tenants uh, through our went well program that community action leads and some of the other programs and we've uh, successfully decreased that number every year um, we were at 2,736 last year that is a cost savings to the court system and to the taxpayers um, by, by doing this other measure. But we are beginning to see eviction court cases going up. And I think that this, uh, from, the, from the input I'm getting, is that people have no other place to go, so they're willing to go to court and fight for their housing so they know that they've got some place. But when they lose, then they're sitting with uh, attorney fees and the court fees, and they still are evicted. So it's really critical that we continue this uh, rent education to them. Other youth homelessness. So this, uh, this definition under Title IV of the McKinney-Vento Act, which is uh, the one that I work mostly with, uh, is focusing on 
uh, youth at less than 18 years of age who are unaccompanied, um, maybe runaway and homeless. And uh, we are able to um, shelter them through a, a shelter that was built by Boys and Girls Aid and opened in Hillsborough in 2007. Um, but we, and then they operate two transitional living <coughs> programs, one funded through McKinney Vento, one funded through their own uh, private uh, uh, philanthropic and other um, uh, funding that their agency has. But other youth homelessness also includes our uh, school, uh, schools, and I know that we're going to have a conversation about, um, at the end of this presentation, about the homelessness within our students. And that is under Title 10, and it, that definition is a little broader than the definition that we use under the HEARTH Act. And so that includes people who uh, may be living in shared housing or couch surfing, as we sometimes refer to. And their data is also a uh, school year uh, cumulative total, whereas when we report for the charge that you're going to see shortly to HUD, who gets, we get our funding, we can only look at a point in time, which is the last week of January. As regarding the uh, youth homelessness uh, in 2014-15 school year, there were 2,148 homeless students in Washington County, and this number continues to rise. The last definition, fleeing domestic or other violence. This is a really important definition. Prior to, uh, and I'll be alluding a little bit to Community Connect, our single point entry system, but prior to that, we have a Monica's House, which is a safe and secure location for people actively fleeing uh, domestic violence. We have seen an increase in the number of elder abuse violence and seniors who have had to flee for their, their own safety. Uh, due to the violence that's beginning to occur in their lives and in their household. Uh, and so we've been placing them as well in, in our uh, DV shelter. Um, but we didn't know the magnitude of what domestic violence is doing to our homeless population. Because prior to Community Connect, the single point system, we the DV folks knew who was becoming DV. The, the district attorney's office and law enforcement knew who was, who was dealing with DV. But the rest of us really didn't have that bigger, higher level scope. Um, and so I'm going to be talking, that's important to know about domestic violence and the definition of it and what, what services we have now. Because as we go forward, this is an operation we need to be focusing on. Unfortunately, under all three of these, the greatest need that we have is uh, the ability to do something profound with uh, these populations because all of our federal funding and the majority of our state funding is really focused at the previous slide. The literally homeless, those who live on the streets and are really struggling to survive out there. So where are we with homelessness? Uh, and this is a chart that uh, started with our first year of our 10 year plan and the um, I guess I should put on my glasses here to make sure I, I quote this right. Uh, so the pink line is for a couple uh, or adult-only households. The blue is for families with children, and the yellow in the very bottom uh, is for youth uh, less than 18 years of age that are unaccompanied and living on, on the streets by themselves. Again, this fits the literally homeless definition, those sheltered and unsheltered. The key part about this is that we know now, this homeless count, as great as, as we've always felt it was, and it takes a lot of work, is an un unfunded mandate by our federal partner in order to receive those three million McKinney Vento funds, that Washington County is big. We're, we're over 700, I believe it was 727 uh, square miles, and a lot of it is suburban and, and rural areas. And when you have to get out there and count, and we interview every single person that this data represents. We've interviewed, we know the person, and then we deduplicate all that data. Um, we now know through Community Connect that we're, we're only counting about half of those people that in the last week of January. So while this 591 homeless people in 424 households uh, is an increase over two years ago, because as you can see from 2013, we're on the wrong trajectory. We're going up again, uh, which is not what we want to see. Uh, we know that that number is doubled. 
when we really think about who's out there in the last week of January. You might recall, why are we so high back in 2009 and 2010? That was the height of the recession. And the homeless individuals that we were working with then were homeless uh, families and individuals who had experienced primarily a job loss. And uh, how we addressed that was different than how we are addressing um, the current housing crisis. Back then, we realized that people, uh, it was a matter of when will the jobs come back and how do we slow down the home foreclosures that was happening. Um, at, because we, we had about 150 home foreclosures a year in the county that we would record. And we went over 1,200 home foreclosures with over 3,000 notices of default that had been filed. So we knew we had to do something to slow that down. At the same time that we knew that we needed to bridge the gap that households were feeling when they lose their job and it takes a month or more before they can get an un unemployment check to begin to help pay their rent and they didn't want to be evicted. So we implemented with our community partners and, the, and uh, funding from the county and the, and the city. And then we also had some ARA funds from the federal government, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act dollars. And we, uh, through the tenure plan, immediately put those dollars together in a, a strategy that we had predefined uh, that actually worked very well for this to provide emergency one month rent assistance and it really staved off a lot of people from becoming homeless, although we still had homeless people. We have worked really closely through the community partners and have decreased that until the housing crisis come. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that as we go forward. Uh, I also want to note that youth and chronic homelessness uh, is on the rise in the last two years. We had 13 unaccompanied youth less than 18 years of age that we interviewed on the streets last year. And 128 chronically homeless people as compared to 77 in 2013. Chronically homeless persons are persons that have been homeless for a year or more or had four more episodes in the last three years. And they have a disability that's been diagnosed by a medical professional that's of a long and prolonged nature that they will most likely uh, always have that disability and not be able to live self-sufficiently. And so that would include like severe and persistent mental illness, uh, a physical disability, um, HIV AIDS uh, and some of those other various disabilities. Unfortunately, six homeless individuals did pass away on our streets last year. This data comes from the Washington County Medical Examiner. Um, and when a person dies unaccompanied out on the streets, the medical examiner goes out with law enforcement. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've done to start to address some of that. Okay, so homeless demographics. So I, I'm not going to get into all of the race and ethnicity and all of that. Uh, I did bring a copy of our tenure plan and annually. Uh, I publish a, a yearly report on the outcomes of uh, the work of the community so that we provide transparency and accountability for every tax dollar that we get. And uh, this also gives us a cumulative uh, snapshot when we look back on our 10 years, or even now as we look back over the last seven, of what happened in each of those years, what worked really well, and what didn't. But I want to pause to really focus on um, one of our major, I, I would think, our major really good outcomes, and that was the development of Community Connect. Community Connect was designed and implemented in two, uh, January 2014, as our single point entry system in Washington County. Prior to that time, individuals who were experiencing homelessness would have to go to, uh, first of all, they'd have to figure out who to call, and a lot of times they call Community Action or 211, trying to figure out where do I go for help. And then they would have to call 20 different agencies or more. They would set up appointments with them. They would go to these agencies and tell their personal story and what was happening in their life and what they really needed. The agency would take their information and put them on a wait list because we maintain a long wait list at every, every one of those agencies. Um, and that was an administrative piece that during the recession, if you recall 2009 and 10, uh, the nonprofits were the first to start cutting staff to stay afloat um, and while well, you know, business times were tough. And so um, we knew then we've got to start working on, on this, creating a way to effectively and efficiently help people get assistance while also creating efficiencies and the scarce dollars that we have in our community. 
So we transformed the uh, Community Action Shelter uh, Access phone number that only served families with children, and that is the green card that you have uh, in front of you. And that now provides uh, someone who will answer the phone uh, for Community Connect, will take some basic information, and then we'll schedule you to meet with a community resource advocate who uh, will uh, help you find the right housing that you need along with the right services. It uses a standard assessment tool designed by our community partners and adopted. Um, it uh, provides uh, homeless families and individuals with equal access to all of the federally and state funded programs within our community. Uh, at an equal opportunity. So when they go to one spot, they're saving their transportation costs, childcare costs, and saving from telling their story over and over. And then every week, trying to remember to follow up with that agency to find out where they are on a wait list, which only prolonged the crisis that these families and individuals experience. So in 2015, 1,911 households were in crisis in Washington County and contacted Community Connect seeking assistance. Of those families, 1,043 uh, completed an assessment for housing and resources and services. And I think, um, and, and Renee, you can shout out at me if I'm inaccurate about this, but um, prior to uh, probably the recession, uh, families used to be the primary homeless population in Washington County, and that's why we have three family shelters. We, we knew that homeless youth was a growing uh, concern, and we, and, and we have a, a youth shelter. We have no shelter beds for single adults in Washington County, or for couples without children, because the focus has always been families and children. But now what we're seeing through Community Connect is that demographic has changed. We have a much greater need for single adult and adult only households. And as we go forward and we're watching the data and who's coming into the system, we know that we've got to do a better job of how do we address that gap and that need in our community. 35% of the households calling last year and coming in for housing assistance were fleeing, were actively fleeing or um, had experienced domestic violence in the last six months. That goes back to that definition I talked to you about earlier. We had no clue it was that big of an issue. And then when we started talking to law enforcement and to the jail and to the district attorney, they're like, oh yeah, it's been here. We've known this. 49% uh, reported having a criminal history. And that was another shocker. Really, why, why so many? And I'm gonna share a, a, one, a story that I learned from one of the caseworkers. A mother with two young children is one of those people self-reported with a criminal history. She shoplifted. She left her domestic violence situation with her two children. It was close to the weekend. She had no place to go. She no, had no family, no connection to a faith organization. Her children were hungry. She couldn't, um, there, there was no place at a shelter for her. She didn't know what to do other than to feed her children and stay behind a store where she thought it was at least safe because the store was one of those stores in our community that pretty much stays open 24 hours a day, so you kind of know where she was staying. Um, and she got apprehended. She was convicted for um, stealing food to go feed her children. So that creates a barrier now. And unfortunately, had to get a place where she could have gone, whether it was seven days a week or not, morning, noon, or night, Maybe she didn't have that on her, on her uh, criminal history now. She admits it was a bad mistake, but she said, I had to do what I had to do. 27% owe landlord debt, and the average is $3,000 per household. And that's significant because we don't have funds from you know, government or others that will get rid of that debt. So we have to, before they can get into this very tight housing market, they gotta figure out how to get rid of that debt. So our caseworkers are working really closely with these uh, families that have these significant housing barriers to figure out other resources in the community. 5% were seniors over the age of 62 years old. This is the growing, the fastest growing population of homelessness in Washington County. And this is the most difficult population for me, right? and I'm for our caseworkers as well, to work with. 
they're not going to be able to go get a job and get 40 hours a week employment and try to figure out how to raise uh, income enough to keep up with the growing rents. And I'm going to show you a little bit about rents here shortly. This is, I'm just going to briefly touch, this is some of the email that Val, who is my, my director, and, and I receive in our department. This is a woman who's 70 years old, who's at her wit's end, and she doesn't understand how can we build jails in other places when there's no place to live. So she's living in a shop. And sadly, there are people who are homeless who come into the lobby that I will talk with before I send them over to Community Connect, who say, you know, I have no place to live, but somebody will let me live in their garage. And I don't want to live there. And I'm thinking, garage or the street? I don't know. There was an 82-year-old man who ended up in the parking lot of Community Action living in his car because his rents had increased and he couldn't keep up. So he used his money to put all of his furniture in storage while he lived in his car and tried to find some type of affordable housing. And, I, and if I recall the caseworker, she cried after he had left. She almost cried when he was there because as he left, he said, my only regret in life, I lived too long. Home is a notion. And uh, I want to read this quote because unless you're really broken or you work with people who are broken, and, and I don't mean that in a negative way, uh, I'm working with a 61-year-old woman who's homeless right now for six months. And she's, that's her term, I'm broken in that. I don't want to be out there anymore. And I, when I read this quote, I thought of her. Home is a notion that only nations of the homeless fully appreciate and only the uprooted comprehend. By Wallace Stegner. So who can we serve? We have done a great job with our tenure plan and our community partners, going after resources and maximizing every dollar. Uh, and I'm not just saying that, we really have. Uh, our HUD officials are very complimentary of the work of everybody in Washington County. So prior to Community Connect being uh, implemented in 2014, you can see all the beds that we have. The brown line is the total of all of them. The others are just the types of housing type that we have. But all of those beds were individuals out there with agencies. And under the formation of Community Connect, we've aligned all of those beds with that front door system. Every day, my office puts out a list of which of those programs have available beds that are empty. So when someone comes into Community Connect and they're assessed for what they need, if there is a, is, there is a permanent supportive housing bed that's open, they're referred directly to that agency that has that available bed so that they can get in. And then we email the agency and say, someone's on their way over. And we're trying to eliminate wait lists because wait lists don't do anybody any good and they're very costly to administer. The other part, uh, with Community Connect is that last year we served 1,885 people in shelter and housing as compared to 1,626 and we have less beds. How did we do that? We used those beds. They're occupied, they were occupied almost all the time. They didn't sit there vacant while an agency was looking for a client that they could put in or screening somebody off of a wait list that had already disappeared because homeless people are not going to be around forever. They're going to keep going wherever they can go to find what they need. So it has improved our effectiveness and our efficiency in using those beds that our dollars are paying for. The reduction in the brown line, and you'll see in the blue line underneath, uh, that permanent supportive housing capacity has been lost due to two reasons last year. Low vacancy rates, meaning that we have very few units in Washington County that are available. So as soon as a unit becomes available, it's turned in a few days and it's reoccupied. Rather than weeks being open, it's days, hours actually. And uh, so, so our, if you're homeless, and then you're hearing, go apply, go apply. There's already all these other people who have applied when it's something that came up. The other thing is that uh, with the rents that have increased in Washington County, we are now uh, spending more dollars 
for every household, so that means we have to serve fewer people. And I have a chart that I'll use to uh, depict that a little better. But I want to also say that last year, coming through Community Connect, there were 652 households that were turned away without a, without a housing option because we just we didn't have the resource to give to them. But we did a great job of helping them figure out where to find food pantries and, and other places to augment their income. So, the poverty link. Why do we have these homeless people? Um, why, why can't we just fix this? Why can't we just house everyone and solve this issue? That's a question we ask ourselves every day. Why do people become homeless? Currently, there are two trends that are largely responsible for the rise in homelessness, that 39% that I just shared previously. A growing shortage of affordable rental housing with more than 14,000 unit gap for households below 50% area median income. This comes directly from the Washington County Consolidated Plan for 2015-2020. There's been great research that has been put into this and that gap has grown every year that, that the consolidated plan has been updated and it gets bigger and bigger. We need to figure out in this county and in this state and in this country how to develop affordable housing for people who are elderly, on fixed incomes, disabled veterans and others who need permanent supportive housing who don't have the income to be able to pay market rate housing as well as um, our working poor. And I'm going to share briefly, I was in the office on a Sunday in November and uh, received an email from an employer who was quite concerned. This employer had a wonderful employee. They absolutely loved this employee. She showed up to work on time, she was hardworking, she was fast, she was quick. She, I mean, this employer spent a lot of time in the email talking about this person, how great, and then said, and I just found out she sleeps in her car, and I'm worried for her safety. She's a young lady, she doesn't belong there. So I responded back, referred to Community Connect, called 211, have her come in, let's see what we can do. Um, do you know why she would be sleeping in her car? Are there housing barriers? Please tell her to kind of get those things together. And it was a few days later, the employer emailed me back, and she said, my employee had to make the difference between having funds to transport herself to the job because she loves what she does versus staying in her apartment because she, uh, and I have her figures here, <laughs> she makes about, uh, her housing cost was over $13,000 a year uh, because she was paying about $1,100 a month for a one bedroom unit. And her salary was 19236 So by the time she paid her housing, this is before taxes, she only had about $5,000 to live on for the rest of the year. And because she really wanted to keep her job, she chose to sleep in her car. Simultaneously with the shortage of affordable housing at 50% and below, that special population is the employment factor. 40% of our positions in Washington County, as reported by Jill Kyler Crook, the Oregon Department of Employment, who is our Washington County economist. She did some great research last July and she presented to the Board of County Commissioners. 40% of the jobs cannot afford a one bedroom unit in Washington County. So that forces those individuals to either look for that affordable housing, which is at 30 and 50% area median income, or go live outside of the county, maybe towards the Yam Hill or Columbia, where rents are a little bit cheaper, and then drive in. So then we start to wonder why we, why do we have transportation challenges on the roadways for people uh, because they can't live where they work, because they can't afford to live where they work. Domestic violence, we talked about that earlier. Uh, we are finding through our work with a Mary Mack House, which is a new county funded program, that some of those individuals, when they really start to tell their stories, they really didn't want to have this violence occur in their lives. But when they couldn't afford the rents, and they can't afford the child care in order to keep the job, uh, and, and the health care wasn't accessible, uh, and, and then their job got cut, so then they were underemployed, it just starts to percolate before you know it. People lose their tempers, and then things happen, and the police get called, and so. 
Mental illness, this is where some of that chronic homeless population increased because people with mental illness, when they apply for housing, I wouldn't say that they're being screened out of housing, but they're certainly not getting into housing. So if you don't have housing and you're going through mental health treatment, your mental health treatment is not going to be as effective as it is if you had housing as a platform by which to really make your treatment work. And lastly, addiction disorders. So people who are poor and addicted have an increased risk of homelessness. How many people who are very affluential and have an addiction really become homeless as compared to people who are poor and living in poverty? So this kind of chart says to me a lot. It kind of sums up what I've just kind of talked about. Here we have uh, housing in the blue. These are rents. And on the left-hand side is Beaver Tinaloa. In the center is Hillsborough. And on the far right side is Tiger Tualatin. And it's the second quarter of 2012. Next column is second quarter 2013. Next column 2014 and 2015. And you can see the rents and how they are dramatically going up. So several hundred dollars a month more in rent. In addition, the red line depicts availability, vacancy rates. So normally, and I'll correct me if I'm wrong, uh, I remember back uh, pre-recession, vacancy rates were 5%, 7% in our communities. And now you see Hillsborough at 1.6%. So that means there's hardly any units up there. So this is truly a very tight housing market. So one in four, one in four households, about 85,000 people, pay more than 30% of their monthly income for rent. I've talked about the 14,000 unit gap. 4.2% uh, of our students in Oregon drop out of high school. Those are our future employees. Those are the people that, how are they gonna afford housing if they're not getting their education? 40% of our jobs, extremely low wage. And $12,792 is the medium annual price of childcare in Washington County. We have some of the highest costs for childcare. So I'm just going to wrap this up with what are we doing in 2016. So first of all, prevention rent assistance. Similar to the recession where we paid a one month rent assistance and we paid the whole month while we bridged until they got funding coming in. We are looking at an innovative way of just bridging the difference between a person paying 50% of their monthly income and if they're paying 90% of their income to rent, we would pay between the 50 and the 90 just to keep them in their housing while we work with them and especially with our senior population and our disabled population to locate something, uh, housing that's more affordable rather than having them out on the streets uh, and, then, and then it's gonna be much more difficult to get them back into some type of housing. Uh, just an average cost of this would be $11 per day per household as compared to $61 per day per person if we needed to put them into shelter. It really does make much more economical and humanitarian sense to invest in letting them stay in housing rather than develop more shelters. Uh, provide a continuum of affordable housing opportunity. So there's a lot of discussion amongst uh, leaders in our community and at the state level and even at the federal level to look at how do we develop more housing at 50% and below. And I'm gonna try to wrap this up really quick. Uh, domestic violence, so we did get county funding and uh, we implemented a new program called Mary Mac House and it's serving um, people with domestic violence with children as well as singles. And by their investment, I was able to write a grant to the Oregon Justice Initiative Act and we got $100,000 in funding from the state for an innovative project. And so now we're going to expand that project, uh, or extend it now, uh, up to two years, which is great work. Legal clinics, we know people coming into uh, Community Connect have legal issues that are barriers to housing. So I reached out with Oregon uh, Law Center, who has committed three pro bono attorneys who now have been integrated into Community Connect and they take those clients who are being screened as housing challenged with, uh, as a result of a legal issue, and they're working with them to resolve those legal issues. And then a housing navigator position. We hired that at Loopdorf, and that person has been helping the, the chronically homeless persons with mental illness uh, to actually work with landlords and access housing. Lastly, we can never 
uh, walk away from our, our planning and our prioritization of funding without looking at the data. And Community Connect provides us that real-time data. And it's really critical to addressing the socioeconomic challenges people face. And I want to close with a picture of a man that you probably, many of you know, um, Ted Williams, the golden voice who made national news. Ted um, was adopted as a child into a good family, um, didn't deal with some issues that he needed to deal with, and became involved in the criminal justice system when he was first arrested at age 21. From there, he moved away from his family and got into alcohol and drugs. It was a spiral down. He lost his job, and so he, reached, he began panhandling. This is how he survived every day. And uh, this news uh, reporter from Columbus Dispatch Reporter would constantly stop and give him money. And one day, and he's videotaped on this, he stops and he says, I'll give you money, but I want to hear. You, got, you say you have a golden voice. I want to hear it. And so he used his golden voice. He did what he used to do, which was an announcer. And he was in such awe that he helped him connect him. And now he has a job. He no longer is addicted. He apologizes for everything he's ever done to his family. He's been um, employed for five years and a contributing tax member of his community and four years of sobriety. But he wanted to let everybody know that it was not easy as he experienced depression, failed attempts at sobriety during his first two years, and bad business deals. But now he's giving back to his community and he has his self-worth. Why do I share that? Because it's one person it took that reporter. We took the time to say, I want to hear your voice. You say you have something to offer. And then making that connection. And today he's a contributing member of society. He's no longer homeless. And he does have an impeccable voice. He actually did the Pepsi commercial for the Super Bowl. So with that, I think I would like to stop so that you have time for eating and other things. Thank you. I don't know what time we need. We have time to squeeze in a few questions. This is such a huge issue. I'm not surprised that the presentation took what it took, and I think you could probably talk longer. And folks, uh, uh, would Mr. Unander wave his hand, please say? There is an article that was published today just adding more information, and Sig is the author right there. It was published by Pamplin Media, and there are copies on the back table if you're interested. And folks, because of time, if you can keep your questions short, I would be great. First question, Bill, go right ahead. No Kroger. Is this fine? No. Go ahead and talk anyway. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Bill Kroger, forum member. Uh, thanks for coming in today. It was an interesting presentation. Thank you. I, I had a, a kind of a dual question. The first part of it is I was wondering if one, which commissioner has sort of taken the lead on this, you know, of the county commission. And uh, the second part is uh, I saw a movie recently and it was talking about of communities in Northern Europe especially, where they build these tiny houses, you know, and they have fixed incomes, or, or they charge a percentage of income and stuff like that. They have governing boards, police, everything, and it's working really well, and I was just wondering if there's any discussion about something like that here. Thank you, Bill. So with regards to the commissioners, I can say all five commissioners are very involved in this issue, but there is one that is appointed by the other commissioners, uh, to be representing this issue, and that is Commissioner Dick Scouten. He is appointed to the Homes Plan Advisory Committee, which is our leadership committee uh, that reports back to the Board of County Commissioners and provides the oversight to the work that I do with our community partners. With regards to tiny houses, there is discussion uh, that is occurring. Uh, with, um, Val Valfrey, who is the executive director of the Housing Authority, in October at the Housing Authority meeting with uh, electeds in our community, uh, had a presentation on tiny houses. And we toured the tiny houses. They actually brought it to the meeting. And some of the issues that we'll have to look at there is local zoning and planning. Uh, what will it take uh, to get those uh, approved? You have the infrastructure, the sewer, water, septic, garbage, all of those issues. And then lastly is just uh, some of those tiny houses have um, uh, balconies that you had need, need to sleep in. And so it's really targeted to people who have mobility, uh, the ability to, to be mobile. Um, but it is an economical way. So we are definitely discussing it and looking at that in Washington County. But thank you. 
Hi, uh, Phil Dowsett, for member, and it's kind of along the line of what was just asked by Mr. Kroger. I think I did a little, did a little research on uh, homelessness because of a friend of mine. And down in Eugene, I believe there's an Episcopal priest who has instituted a program which has resulted in the development of small huts, <coughs> which are plastic and they're insulated, that they're being built at six feet by 10 feet, they cost $250 or so a piece, and then they're being put into sites where you have communal uh, dining and showering and educated place to be on a computer and such. Is there any consideration being given in Washington County to, to doing such a program or maybe at least investigate what Eugene is doing in that regard? Apparently they're being quite successful in it. Thank you, Phil. I have uh, briefly spoken to my counterpart, which is Pearl Wolf, who's in Wayne County, uh, down in Eugene, and she has talked about some of the great outcomes with regards to that model. There also have been a few uh, areas that they've had to overcome, so I'm not sure if you're aware of the terminology NIMBYism, not in my backyard, N-I-M-B-Y. Um, and so those kind of models takes a really, uh, uh, it takes great leadership and community um, participation and openness so that people feel comfortable with that coming into their community. But definitely we're looking at that along with tiny houses because we really do want to get people out of camping along our waterways and our sidewalks and our parking structures and other places. Um, not only just because it, it creates an environmental issue along our waterways, but for safety aspects as well. But thank you. Um, Jim Cape, four member. I have a question about, like, you were talking about Dick Skelton and then this article about Sig Unander. Mm -hmm. I mean, the people who most talk about the homelessness really aren't doing anything. They're just pimping the issue because it's easy, cheesy PR. Yet, I mean, what does Sig Unander, how much taxes and bonds and fees does he pay? I mean, he seems to have lots of free time, yet, how is he paying his insurance or his retirement? They're using the issue, yet no one is held accountable for increased unemployment, for increased homelessness. It's just a cheesy, easy PR issue that everyone pats themselves on the back, yet no one is held accountable. Thank you. So I can say that when I started this discussion, I said uh, I am most interested in all of your comments because it takes all of us to address this issue. Isn't this isn't something that the county can do or a city or it really takes all of us. And part of that is public education. Just like I'm here today, I could be at the office. I've got a bunch of reports I need to get to HUD. Um, so I keep the funding coming into our community because that's your tax dollars. Prior to my taking on this role, our county got about $500,000 a year, and that was considered really well. And I knew that we could do much better. I, I don't know if you know, I come from Intel Corporation. I have a 10-year uh, background in new product development planning management. Uh, we help develop things and send them over to Puerto Rico and other places. When I approach this issue, I approach it from a business standpoint, but part of that business standpoint is public education and accountability. That is why every year I publish a year sub or a yearly report and it's presented to the Board of County Commissioners and then it's mailed to every mayor, every city councilor, this governor, the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness in Washington, D.C. And if somebody would love to take a copy of it across the hall to uh, our president, I would be most happy, but I, you know, um, I feel like I've kind of spanned people enough with that aspect. But, so I think that we all come at this social issue from a different perspective. Mine comes from also a very personal place because my uncle is homeless. And when I talked about Ted Williams and that one person that changed his life, it was my mother. My mother came from a family of 16 children. And nobody wanted to have anything to do with my uncle Dick. But he came to my mom's dairy farm and she said, I will put you up. I will help you get your life back. And she did. And he moved into housing and he was a very successful person until he died of cancer at age 52. So part of this, I'm doing it because it's a business aspect. Part of it I'm doing because I really love working with people. It's different. Intel has widgets, 
So when they're end up a production line, it stays the same way and it doesn't change until you come back the next morning. Working with people, every day is different. No one person is the same as anybody else. And so I feel like if I can help change one life, that's part of one too. And so maybe these electeds and these authors, they're doing their part as best they can. And we just have to figure out how to move it forward even better. And part of that comes through our connections such as today. Once again, Annette, thank you for a comprehensive look at a huge problem. I'm sorry for those folks that wanted to ask some questions. I cut them off so we can put a couple of other things here in our program today. And that was generous to allow that extra time. And Annette, do you have a few moments after 1 o'clock? Because I think people will want to ask you sure. a few more questions. Great. And she will be around. Please feel free to corner her. About four years ago, uh, because of my involvement in human rights in the county and in the city of Beaverton and uh, uh, oh, I don't know, a questionably wise decision to run for office several years ago, I learned that there were more homeless students in Beaverton than anywhere else in the state. And I said, come on, Portland, it's got to be Portland. No. Well, I was very well educated and had the opportunity to meet another hardworking lady, one of the hardest working ladies in this difficult <coughs> task. And today, I want to introduce you to Lisa Belmentasana, who will give us just a few minutes, not to give us another you know, kind of review of the terrible problem. I'm afraid we're all pretty well educated. But there's been a marvelous program started coming up in April in Beaverton, and I really want Lisa to have a few moments to share that with you. Lisa Belmentasana, please. District and Beaverton has had the highest number of homeless students in the state of Oregon for six consecutive years. I agree with everything that Annette told you. Um, the lack of affordable housing is driving homelessness in our county and our community right now. Um, in Beaverton, and I'm just representing Beaverton students in my job role and their academic success. We're working really hard to help our community understand what's going on. We will be holding a, um, a community awareness event in April. It will be a sleep out and it is being hosted by the Beaverton Social Justice League. Um, it will be by invitation only. Um, but that's just the beginning of creating awareness to some of the challenges that we're facing in Beaverton. Our ultimate goal is that we build a sheltering network that will help families transition into long-term stable housing. Um, Beaverton does not have a single family shelter. Also, we've really had a very challenging um, past four years because um, the severe weather shelters closed to families with children, with the exception of one in Forest Grove. So when we need that emergency shelter, when a family comes to us on a Friday night and says, I've been evicted and I don't have a plan in place, um, we're sending them out to Gresham. So that's something that we really need to address as a community. And I agree that we need to place people in homes, um, stable housing, but we still need that emergency shelter system just to stabilize them until we can figure out a plan of action. So that's kind of what we're working on in Beaverton for our families with students. Last year we had over 1,600 children living with housing instability issues. Birth through graduation from high school. And that equates to, oh, probably about 600 families. And as a district, we share these resources with seven other school districts. So if you'd like more information, um, you can Google Shelter Us Beaverton. We have a Facebook presence and um, you can find out more about what we're doing in our community. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Lisa. Once again, thank you for doing that. Next week, folks, same time, same station, Monday the 29th, we have Jake.
Wiegler from the Oregon Alliance for Gun Safety. I think we can figure out what his major topic will be. And on Monday, the 7th of March, we have Ben Unger going to talk about our Oregon's uh, corporate tax measure. And we will be having somebody speaking in opposition to that as well. Uh, it will be a debate. This organization is committed to presenting both sides of an issue when there are two sides to an issue. We didn't have an advocate for not having housing uh, today, but I just couldn't find one. No matter how hard I look. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for putting up with my bizarre sense of humor today. Thank you for being here, and we'll see you next Monday. Take care.